Yeah. Uh, I just noticed Nick uh, bounced into our speaker group here. Mm -hmm. Is that supposed yeah, to happen? Let me, let me change him to an attendee. No problem. Not that I don't like Nick. Yeah. Uh, I just noticed Nick uh, bounced into all good. All right, I'm going to get going, Maddie. Is that good? Yeah, that's great. I think we'll have a couple more join, but we can go ahead and get started. Wonderful. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for uh, popping on to our webinar, uh, Unleashing the Power of Data and AI. Um, you know, really, this is a, a really great opportunity, and we're in a really good moment in time here to um, begin to talk about the relationship between data analytics and AI. Um, just a little bit of background here. I'm Mike Adsby. I'm going to be moderating today. Um, I am the founder and chief innovation officer here at O3. I run strategy, new products and services, and our innovation practice at O3. Um, and one of the big things that we are, are doing here is, um, is really looking at um, uh, data analytics as a service, but in relationship with AI and how that impacts customer experience, which I'll hop into in a moment. Um, just some background on uh, O3. Uh, we are customer experience consultants. Uh, everything we do is really built around building better experiences. And I say customer experience, but that could just as easily be patient experience, employee experience, um, you name it. Um, and really what we're trying to do is not just um, understand where gaps and opportunities lie within the journeys, but really try to create solutions that help to um, either streamline, um, expedite, or really take advantage of opportunities to build better, more compelling, remarkable experiences. Um, so today we're going to be talking about um, data analytics and AI, and, and really uh, our point of view on this, because we're customer experience consultants, is, is really trying to find the relationship between AI and how it can empower uh, better customer experience. And really where that happens is in this cross-section with data. Um, data is really the connecting fabric um, between um, these amazing customer experiences we want to create and really being able to empower them with AI. Um, and that we're going to hop into that um, in three parts today, which I'll, I'll go through in a moment. Um, quick story here, though, just to sort of paint a picture. Uh, many years ago, I'm going to talk about 2015. Uh, I was in San Francisco for a conference. Um, and at the time, a brand new company popped up called Bonobos. You might be familiar with it. or uh, I know they have one on Walnut Street here in Philadelphia. Uh, it was a really, um, I was excited. I, I, I knew that they were an online only company, but they had these pop-up stores at the time here and there. So you could go try on the clothes and see, um, see how they fit. So I went into the store, tried on uh, some clothes. And, and if you're not familiar with Pinobos, they have all different cuts and sizes for, um, um, for men to, to uh, try different um, types of fits because we're all different sizes and whatnot. Uh, and I found a pair of pants that I really liked. Um, and I have a little bit of an athletic build. So that was a thing that was necessary. Well, um, you know, uh, the interesting part was I couldn't just buy the, the pants there. I, I, I couldn't just take them home. And their whole model is you go into the store, you try the stuff on, and then, and then you, you order it online, and then they send it to you, which, is, which was great, and it was fine. Um, but by the time I got back to Philly, and I was excited, my pants were going to come up. I, I tried my pants on, and, and I don't know if I, I gained 15 pounds between uh, San Francisco and Philadelphia, but at the end of the day, they did not fit. Um, and what I found out was that whatever the person at the store had keyed into um, their platform and it was incorrect. I and mean, I had the wrong cut, the wrong size. The problem is they had so many, I had no way of telling customer support, like, no, this is the size I want because I don't know because they, they keyed it in. What this is, is an example of um, a, a customer experience where if the data it was better connected. If the experience was a little more proactive, um, I might have had a better outcome. And the reality was I ended up not shopping at Bonobos again until they actually opened a store here in Philadelphia, which was like four or five years later. So who knows how many other transactions they lost because of a, a gap in that experience. We're in a world now, though, where data analytics, AI really help us to create better customer experience. The connected experience is really what we're able to uh, empower now. And that's an important part of this. 
Well, we look forward to 03, though, all the time, whether it's any kind of experience we're trying to do, are, are really three things to, that, that create great customer experience. The first is uh, personalized or hyper-personalized experiences. So one thing to realize with, uh, with um, any sort of experience is that people want it personalized to them. The more personalized it is, and the data bears this out, the more inclined they are to interact with a brand or service. Um, the thing about personalization, though, personalization can be hard. Um, the systems we have now are, are, are generally machine learning based. They require a lot of data. They make it difficult to really empower that. But now, I would say in the last year or so, with the rise of, of generative AI, ChatGPT, et cetera, these become a lot more uh, available to us. The other thing is we want relationships uh, or our um, experiences to be predictive and effortless. We want them to be connected. Um, my experience with Bonobos was challenging because, um, because of a, a lack of connection. It required a human in the middle of it to, to submit data. Well, wow, wouldn't it have been awesome if I could have just scanned a tag to the clothing, pop that in, and that would have been that. Now, I'm sure these days they're doing all that in the store, and I've had a, a very good relationship with the brand now. But that, these are the sort of things that require data and require smart systems to make them happen in order to create great experiences. And finally, proactive. Anytime you have a problem, the best way to solve a problem is to be in front of it and to, and to highlight the problem ahead of time. Um, really, as someone sort of engages with anyone from a customer support perspective, being able to tell per the, a person, hey, we know who you are. We know what you've already done here. We know how you shopped or, or the types of products you have it makes the person feel a much more personal experience. And that proactive nature is something that really helps to uh, create just a, a better outcome. So those are three things we look for, personalized, predictive, and proactive relationships. And really, again, it's data, it's analytics, and now it's AI that's really helping to empower that. All right, so we're going to touch on three things here today. Um, really, we're going we're gonna to hop into data analytics and the relationship with AI and sort of part one of this, uh, this conversation. Uh, and part two, uh, we're going we're gonna to take that one step further and talk about how we can empower um, um, AI solutions through uh, CDP and, and personal information and make them hyper-personalized. And we actually have a bit of a demo for that. And of course, we can't talk about data, we can't talk about analytics, we can't talk about AI unless we are talking about the concerns that come up around your personal privacy, IP security, and a lot of the new legal considerations that are coming up. Uh, and we have speakers in, in, in all three of these categories uh, uh, to help us out. But uh, part one here, uh, we're going to talk about data revolution insights into the analytics world. Uh, and today we have with us um, Mahesh Katunde, who's our chief digital officer here at O3. Uh, Mahesh runs our uh, uh, data engineering and analytics um, side of the house here at the, at the uh, company. Uh, so we're excited to have him. And then uh, Kerry Bolton, who is a data analytics consultant uh, that we've been working with for quite a while now. Um, and we're excited to have you both. So, so uh, both welcome. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen now and kind of hop into this. Um, so uh, it's great to have you both. Uh, I'm excited to kind of hop into this. Uh, uh, so I want to start with, um, with you, Kerry. So Let's talk about some considerations um, now that we've kind of have this new world of generative AI, people have a lot of questions about it. Let's dive into um, how is it impacting um, marketing strategy and operations and, and what are some considerations that people need to uh, uh, start to consider? Sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, I think it's a really timely question, given a lot of companies are going into business planning and budgeting. You want to have a clear idea of what you're what your needs are so that you get the resources to support it. So I think the companies who win at generative AI are going to develop differentiated hyper-personal content at scale, right? And that's that's not what's coming out of ChatGPT right now. <laughs> it's going to take a lot of work to get to that point. And I think there's kind of three areas I want to briefly talk about that, that are considerations. Um, you know, the first one is make sure your needs are driving the the technology choices and not the other way around. Lots of shiny objects out there looking for solutions. Um, I think you should be intentional about helping your team develop their skills and adjusting their workflow. Um, and I think you should also um, consider measuring the impact of AI so that you can quantitatively, quantitatively say, this is what we're getting out of this investment. Um, so the, the first part is, you know, make sure your needs are, are driving your choices. So your AI strategy has got to be subordinate to your marketing strategy. It, it should be supportive 
um, of your marketing strategy, you still need all the basics, right? You need to know who your audience is. You need to have a strong brand voice. You need to have a solid content strategy. All those things need to be in place. And that should be driving um, the choices you're going to have to make around uh, different AI technologies. Um, and to do that, you know, you need to be really good friends with your technology partners, you know, your head of engineering, your head of IT, whoever that is, like, you are going to need those people. Um, and, and try to find somebody who's a hybrid, who understands your marketing use cases and understands the technology. Um, because it's going it, to, into my second point, you know, being intentional about helping your team uh, develop their skill set. If as you start to develop this differentiated, hyper-personalized um, content and creative, um, that's a, those are some pretty specific skills you're going to have to develop. So feeding the model, validating the model, mm -hmm. critical thinking skills are at a premium. You're going to need your folks to be able to research and fact check um, and, and be able to edit. So a lot of editors are writers, but not all writers are editors. So that might be a that might be a skill, for example, that you need to that you need to develop, um, and also consider AI in the context of your marketing workflow. You've probably got a few bottlenecks here and there. Maybe it's you know legal review. Maybe it's some of your Martech. You know, if you're still uploading email campaigns manually, like you really want to talk to your head of engineering about how to do some integration work, so that you can take advantage of that um, you know additional throughput. And I think the last piece is measuring that impact. So what is what's really important to your organization? Um, is it quality? You know, do you want to be able at the end of this year to say, hey, our click through rates are up 10 percent because we were able to, um, you know, do a lot of experimentation on our headlines and now we're getting additional business. Um, it could be cycle time. You know, we took two days off our email campaign process. Um, it could be even throughput. You know, we were able to experiment you know, 60% more and therefore drive, uh, drive our goals. So think about what the, what the important things are to you and, and choose those metrics in advance before you get too far into the weeds um, of the technology so that you've got kind of a North star. Yeah, that's, that's really important. I think oftentimes, particularly as you said, the shiny object, I think people get too lost in the fact that oh, it's AI, like I'm going to sprinkle some AI on this problem and we're going to solve all the world's problems. And the reality is like any other tool, you need to start with business objectives. You need to understand what your outcomes you're looking for. And to your point, uh, which I think is, is so critical is having those KPIs in place so that you can track, you know, what the investment uh, really means for an organization. I think that's critical. Um, and we look at it through journeys and, and thinking about where within those journeys we can sort of make the biggest impact. Um, but I think that, that that's really where this needs to start is, is outside of the world of technology and in, 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 you know, really the strategic room, as it were, uh, which, which is really important. Um, but as you mentioned, uh, partnering with technology is really important. And, and as I know, you, you partner with, with Mahesh here. Uh, we'll, we'll switch gears a little bit. Mahesh, um, I, I am interested, and I'm sure everyone here is interested in talking about some of the latest advancements um, in AI, ML, and, and really what are we doing to make sort of personalized and predictive customer service possible? Oh, <laughs> I think it's, quite evident from the example that he gave Mike about the Bonobo's experience that he had, that uh, personalization and predictive customer service, they aren't just luxury anymore, right? People are expecting it to be the baseline expectation. Um, they demand experiences that not just resonate with their unique needs and preferences, but also anticipate them as you're you know, interacting with the brand. Um, these could be from interpretation of your interactions in a more human way, um, you know, detecting underlying emotions that you're, you know, interacting with the brand, um, even predicting future needs and just everything in the, mid in the middle there. So the customer expectations are high. The good news is that there are tools and platforms available that are leveraging some of the advanced AI and ML functions to drive these experiences, right? So a few things that come to my mind, uh, NLP, natural language processing, um, it's essential for the interpretation of customer interactions. So understanding their preferences, uh, tailoring the communication to each individual style and needs, uh, it's critical and NLP makes it happen. Uh, one example that comes to my mind is an AI-driven chatbot, which is able to handle uh, customer inquiries in a in more conversational and a personalized manner. So imagine you were interacting with that brand Bonobos through an AI-driven chatbot. That experience would have been slightly better than what you experienced then. 
Um, another one is sentiment analysis. Um, you want to understand what your customer is thinking at any given point of time um, so that the, the brands can provide that more empathetic and personalized response to it. Mm -hmm. So if there is a negative sentiment been built, it's been triggered, you can immediately start some service interventions. So realizing that your pants did not fit, that should have been something like a precursor and then doing some actions behind it, um, either making a phone call, offering some coupons or discounts or whatever. Uh, on the flip side, if you have some positive sen sentiments building up, then you should be able to recommend uh, other related products and services. Um, another one is uh, predictive analytics, right? Which can really help your brands to um, anticipate the customer needs and proactively offer solutions even before the customer is even aware of that. Um, and that involves predicting, you know, what products and services their customer might be interested in but they might also need a support uh, after the product is brought, um, bought into um, so that they can make sure that they are a loyal customer for a long time on. Um, Real-time analytics, I think that's a key part of any kind of a, uh, a MarTech system that is driven through AI, um, which can react instantly to customer behaviors. Um, you know, for example, if you're in your, um, if you're on an e-commerce website and you're abandoning your shopping cart realizing it and making counter offer or making some suggestions there, that's critical. And in all of this, um, if you think about it, um, CDP or customer data platform, it kind of sits at the core of the Martech stack, right? It, it serves as a central hub for all your customer data um, and AI and data, it, it becomes sort of the driving force to empower that CDP, um, making it kind of a strategic and a dynamic component of your overall Martech stack. Um, because you want to make sure that your CDP is going to transition from being a passive data repository mm -hmm. to becoming a more intelligent and a personalized marketing tool. So when you look at the CDP, um, what, what it does, it, it basically does a data collection from backend systems. You have multiple systems where your customer data is residing right now uh, through the multiple channel interactions, collecting all the data, profile unification, making sure you're creating a customer 360 profile. So as, as Mike goes onto Bonobos, they know who Mike is, they know the past transactions, they know what the intents are and reacting to it by providing a personalized experience. Um, and then obviously optimizing that experience on a continual basis, which is your instance of MarTech is not a point in time installation. It has to continuously improve upon itself. And that's what AI does behind the scene going on. Uh, so, that's great. That's great. And I, I actually, the, the point there too, um, about centralizing the customer data, I think is so critical to all this. I, you know, I think oftentimes people look at AI and, and what they don't consider is the importance of data in, in really making AI work. Yeah. Uh, without data, we, we don't have much. And, and I think that you know, when we shift gears into thinking about personalization, and we think about what we're really talking about there. It's not just having the data, it's understanding the data and being able to make those proper assumptions. Because at the end of the day, it still requires that a human in the mix, you know, looks at all this and says, okay, that's what a personalized experience should be, not this, right? So I think that's important, but I, I think it's a good transition. And, and, and Carrie, let me flip it back to you here and, and Mahesh, feel free to chime in here, but let's talk about a little more dive, dive in a little bit more about personalization, not just personalization, but hyper-personalization, getting down to the individual, not just like a segment. Um, talk to us a little bit about um, some considerations um, when we're trying to create that hyper-personalized experience. And most especially when we think about trust and relevance. Absolutely. Uh, personalization and, and especially hyper-personalization really creates a virtuous cycle where you're you know, driving customer loyalty and customer retention. They're coming back to you. They're doing more things with you. They're creating more data so that you can continue to personalize um, their, their experience. But all that data and Mahesh, what you described is like nirvana, right? You've got everything in one place and you're continually feeding it in. Um, that's a huge responsibility, right? And how do you bring that human touch to the relationship? And I think it's about really respecting your, your customers and creating transparency in the relationship. And there's kind of, there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, kind of the top three considerations I think are making sure the types of personalizations are what they're looking for. Like there's a lot of things you could do. You could provide product recommendations, you could help them with navigation, but you know, do some surveys, talk to some customers, understand, is that really what they want? Is it helping? Um, so that you've got that human feedback 
in the loop. Um, and you also want to demonstrate your investment in the relationship. So once a transaction does happen, you know, it's not just you're done, you know, check back in, see how the purchase went. Uh, hey, Mike, did those pants fit? No? Oh my gosh. You know, <laughs> um, there's a lot you can do to, to make them feel like you're developing a relationship and not just trying to get them to buy stuff. Um, you know, don't be creepy, like be super transparent. Here's Here's why you're seeing this recommendation. Here's why we're doing this. Uh, just a, a point there. Don't be creepy might be the best strategic advice you could possibly right. get right. in the personalization. Tell them what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. 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 there's, a, there's a gray out. area in there for sure. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, let, letting them opt out is is also important. And I think another thing under transparency is, you know, I know the legal department needs 27 miles worth of, of content, um, you know, especially in regulated industries like financial services and pharma, but often you can you can add something at the top that's a little bit more, you know, kind of interprets what's happening. Like, here are the things that we're doing, like say it in plain language and then like put the rest in the footnote. Um, because often people think you're trying to hide something if you've got 16 pages of of legalese. Yeah, for sure. And and I, you know, that last portion we're going to touch on uh, in the third part of this uh, of this conversation with um, Andy, um, uh, who's a, a privacy and security attorney, um, and, and that that'll that'll help us to sort of map out some of those concerns as well. But um, but all all good stuff. Um, why, why don't we let's let's and this is for both of you and, and, and maybe Ash, why don't you chime in here first? Um, just as sort of a last point here before we open it up to questions. Um, Let's talk about, all right, so this all sounds awesome, but obviously there's a lot of work to be done here, right? This, you know, uh, never mind the data wrangling necessary um, within any organization, never mind enterprise organizations who probably have years and years of this stuff to, to sort through. Um, and, and those big transformations are challenging, but but let's talk about some recommendations. Um, let's talk about recommendations for those who are sort of starting out on this journey um, and, and maybe on the a lower end of the data analytics maturity scale and how can they sort of start to take advantage of um, these ideas we're talking about, being personalized, being proactive, being predictive, leveraging AI, and, and really where can people kind of um, get going? Nash, why don't you yeah. get started there? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And I think it's quite natural for companies um, to feel a, bit, a little, little bit overwhelmed by the, the range and scale of tools and the techniques and the best practices that exist. Because if you go online and make a search for how do I start this, you're going to get a ton of content. The key to progress, however, lies in approaching this as a journey, right? And it's not, don't look at it like a monumental shift of what you're doing. It's a journey that you start. Um, so it has to be managed through a series of manageable steps. And I can think about like three or four maybe key areas to focus on. I mean, start first one is start with a clear objective. It's important to know what you want to achieve. Um, are you trying to understand customers better? Are you trying to bring operational efficiencies? Define clear achievable goals. I think that should be the first step. Um, data and the literacy behind it is not just for the data team or the IT team. It should be across the board. So make sure everyone in the company understands the value of data and how to use it responsibly. Um, you could do training, uh, you could do workshops, lunch and learn lessons, uh, sessions and so on and so forth. I think that really helps. Um, and the third one I can think about is to start small and then scale, right? Don't take time to take a big portion of this, of this pie. Um, start with a small project where, you, where you're seeing there is a benefit to using um, you know, AI and data. Um, this could be a specific business function or, um, you know, within internally within your organization, or it could be a customer piece. But once you prove the value of data, then you can start to scale up in other areas. Um, then the last one I can think about is to make sure that you are ensuring privacy and ethical considerations are there from the get-go. Um, if you are dealing with data, if you're dealing with customer information, you have to respect data privacy. So make sure that your framework is right. Make sure you have people to be able to talk to, uh, talk to you know, AI ethicists, talk to your legal department. Make sure that is an, a good baseline to understand how ethics can be built on because you can't start a process and then start putting ethics at a later stage. That, that's, a, that's a big no-no from my perspective. Um, there are many more, but I think these four are some of the key things that, that we can um, recommend our clients uh, if they want to start on the journey. That's great. Carrie, anything to add there? Yeah, I would kind of build on that. Uh, I think that was your third point, you know, understand what's happening 
there are going to be models in the background of AI. And you want to make sure that it's not completely black box, right? You don't have to understand all the math and everything that's happening, but understand the inputs, you know, put those data controls in place as much as you can, try to anonymize your data, um, really reduce the risk of, of all this customer data that you've got. Um, and you know, and with those controls, have some management reviews so that you're following those controls and understand what's happening, you know, maybe even some model governance in there um, so that, you know, you don't end up with a crisis and you're kind of thinking, I don't know what it just spit out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, I think one of the big things that you both pointed out there, so two things I'll react to, certainly business goals and objectives, but tying that back to explainability, I think is key. Um, that you have an action and interaction is um, it, it is really important, but that you understand the interaction, I think, is critical. I, and I'll say it, I, you know, and you're already seeing it with, you know, these conversations with, you know, CEO of OpenAI, with um, uh, the guy from Google. Uh, I mean, they're all saying like that sometimes they, they're not really understanding wholly what the outputs look like and what that means. So I think that that is definitely something that we need to think harder about. Um, and the second part of this, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, sort of empowering AI and, and really what an application here looks like. But I think that that's those are all really great points uh, um, to, that people can, can consider. Um, OK, we're going to take a few minutes here, open this up to uh, audience questions. So if you have any, please just pop them in the chat. Um, we have a couple here, though. Um, Mahesh, you, you hopped into this already, but. Maybe we can do a little bit of a deeper dive here. Um, just really discussing the role CDs, CDPs in particular play in creating personalized experiences with AI. Um, maybe open that up a little bit and, and dive into that a little bit deeper for us. Yeah, sure. Um, so as I said before, when your CDP kind of sits at the core of your MarTech stack, right? It's, it's that your central hub for all the data that's coming in. Um, Think about your interactions, your brand's interaction with your customers. They are happening at different levels. You're interacting with your brands on your website, your mobile phones. Uh, you could be interacting with them through email campaigns. Um, they could be interacting through a kiosk machine for that matter. Um, they could be going into a, a store, a point of sale transaction might be happening. They might be calling in in a customer service. That's again, another interaction. All these data points, when they are collected within your system, they are sitting in different line of business systems behind the scene. It could be your CRM system. It could be your point of sale systems. It could be your ERP systems and could be many more, right? Uh, social media, that's another one. Big web interactions. When you go on Facebook now, based on what you purchase on Amazon, you immediately see those recommendations coming into your Facebook, right? So all these data points that have been collected about the customer's preferences, their searches, their interests are being collected in different areas. The idea behind CDP is to bring it all together in one place so you can make some intelligent outcome from it, mm -hmm. right? Building a, a profile saying that Mahesh has been on these five different websites and here is a trend that I'm seeing or the brand is seeing in terms of where the interest lies. And then based on that, making an understanding. So if I make a phone call and say, hey, Best Buy, I'm trying to buy these speakers, they should already know which speakers I've already looked into through the different, um, you know, the different channels. So that's the idea behind um, uh, CDP. It's a little bit more complex than that because when you're introducing a CDP in a platform, you, you have this big task of making sure your, your data is brought together. That's a huge first step to make sure that you have identified your data sources and there is a way to pipe them into the single source. So having that baseline framework, the first step is critical. Once your CDP is set up, then the CDP engine will do all the magic behind it. But that first step is very critical to make sure you have a successful CDP implementation. Yeah, you know, one thing to hop into there as well, going back to your point about business objectives, you know, it's not just about collecting the information. It's about really also collecting the feedback loops to inform the information that you have to make sure it aligns back with those business objectives. And again, you know, going back to the, the question earlier about starting, I mean, this still all starts with just making sure that that strategy is well aligned. Um, so I think that's that's really that's really great. Um, last question here, and I know we're going to run a little bit over, but we had to do the little preamble here. So we'll probably be about five minutes late, which is fine. Um, but how can we take advantage of all the new AI tools on the market while also making sure that my data and potentially my customer's data remain secure? Um, I don't know which one you wanna tackle that, but uh, you know, hop right in. Go ahead, Carrie. Yeah, I think I have it. Well, actually to get back to the last point about the CDP, like once you've got it all together, that's awesome. But I think 
also to add on to that, you know, careful analysis is important. There can be a lot of bias in the system. There can be a lot of bias, you know, with your data scientists. I'm thinking of an example from a while ago, you know, we were working on customer lifetime value and we said, you know, people who call in, they cost us money. We should, you know, and then we realized they were calling in because the journey wasn't right and they were valuable customers. So there's, there's always bias in that system. And I think careful analysis over time, um, you know, not just taking what the system spits out is really important. Um, and on the, on the data piece, again, having those data controls in place and as you're building models, kind of creating a, um, a rule I've seen evolutions where, you know, the data scientists always say, give me all the data, just give me everything. Um, and I think coming, trying to get the culture to be more like, okay, give me the bare minimum that I need, you know, and I'll go back and get more when I need it so that you're not overusing customer information um, or non-anonymized information. Um, the more careful you can be, the better, especially as you're starting out, put those systems in place. Yeah, for sure. Um, Mahesh, you want to hop into that a little bit, talk about, you know, um, how do we keep the information secure? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's the most critical part. So making sure that your data is secure, it should be the number one objective on any data uh, projects that you have. Um, and right now, especially with generative AI, that's a nascent space. Um, it is It has been in existence for less than a year right now, um, just getting into the corporate world at this point of time. I don't think there are um, enough uh, uh, implementations right now to be able to identify what some of the gotchas are in terms of setting up a generative AI type setup and what the potential outcomes could be if it does not do it the right way. Because chat GPT, as you know, it is it captures data from end users and the end users are free to ask whatever they want to. So unless they know they're not supposed to provide PII, their personal information, right, right. they will submit that information and in, as, as without any uh, known consequences, you will end up having data breaches or, or data being um, sent outside your, your security boundaries right. around it. Right, and so, that's, why, that's why a lot of these big orgs, and we have several clients are, you know, immediately put out policies, you no know, using ChatGPT on site with our information, you know, for IP protection, um, yeah. more or less. So talk to your vendors, make sure there's a clear understanding and expectation from the vendor as to what your data security policies are, and there's a complete match to it. Um, and uh, even if you're doing a pro proof of concept, make sure these data security boundaries are set well, um, yeah. right? So I think that's that's a critical part for sure. Yeah, and I just something else to tack onto that is we're discovering uh, with a lot of the POCs we're starting to develop. You know, this this all comes down to starting small and 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 sort of developing from there. Um, there are, you know, in, I mean, there's new AI things coming out every day through through the key vendors, right? The Microsofts of the world, et cetera. Um, and, you know, they do have, you know, whole new privacy security and even, you know, HIPAA compliant solutions that are coming out. Yep. To your point, it still requires the due diligence necessary to make sure that you're not getting over your, your skis, as it were, with any one of these solutions and really kind of starting small and sort of building on top of that, which, which is really important. The way we're looking at it is, hey, let's start with publicly accessible information, stuff that you're okay kind of getting out there, things that are already seeded or indexed by a Google it's fine. And then, and then that way you can start to see what are the boundaries? What are you getting in? What are you getting out um, before you start to integrate in PII and, 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 and some more of this personal information? However, this would be a good transition and segue into our next segment. Um, you know, it, it really is when you start to layer in the personal um, information where we can really begin to empower some really remarkable experiences, the things that get to that super personalized, very product, proactive and very predictive type of experiences. Um, so with that, and we're gonna transition now over to our next segment. I wanna thank Mahesh and Kerry for, for joining us. Um, this was fantastic, really appreciate your insight. Uh, and um, yeah, if anyone has any additional questions, you can pop them in the chat and we'll, we can follow up with them a little bit later. So uh, thanks Mahesh and Kerry. Um, um, we're gonna transition now over to our, our uh, next segment here. Um, and uh, just something to kind of start with, um, as we sort of ended the last one there, um, I do think there's something to be said for the fact that while, while you know, we want to be sort of considerate of um, these AI solutions, the data, the, you know, customer data in particular, um, there's really a moment in time here, though, to really think about what's possible. A lot of the... Um, 
solutions we were talking about five, 10 years ago. I, I was looking at a, a deck I put together in 2017, which sounded awesome, but like fr frankly, wasn't achievable. Um, data was, or AI was hard and a lot harder than it is now because we had to collect so much information. And unless you had enough information at scale, it was really difficult. A lot of these machine learning models required enormous feedback loops. So there's a lot there that was challenging. Now, you know, with everything that sort of Mahesh and Kerry were talking about with CDP, the relationship between what you can do with those data models uh, or with the data and, and some of these um, AI models is, is pretty compelling. And, and that's where we want to hop into here next. Um, so with that said, um, I want to talk about um, kind of our, our uh, uh, next uh, uh, couple uh, speakers here. Um, let's start with just a, a quick introduction. So we have Will Toms um, from from uh, Rec Philly, um, who's going to be talking to us about uh, their vision uh, for um, uh, leveraging AI to really create that personalized, proactive, and predictive experience for their member base. Uh, Rec is, um, uh, like to say, a, 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 the membership organization um, really empowering the creative economy. Um, so um, all of these individual creators um, really allowing them to connect with each other, um, people like videographers, um, musicians, um, photographers, and, and really helping them to um, build on these creative careers and even connecting with brands uh, as well through that process. But in doing so, you know, the, the idea there is, is, to, is to really um, see what is uh, possible um, through technology to really help to do that. Um, we are working with them on uh, uh, a series of technologies uh, to, to help to empower those uh, experiences, but it really does come down to the experience. So um, in this part, you know, um, we're going to be uh, speaking to uh, two folks here. Uh, Josh Friedman is um, a senior engineer here at O3. Uh, Josh is also uh, uh, working with a, a few folks here to lead our efforts in, in AI strategy uh, for our clients. Um, Josh is working very closely uh, with the REC team uh, and REC process. And, and as I just mentioned, Will Toms, who's a founder and, and chief creative officer at REC. Um, and we're, we're happy to have you both and, and, and thank you for joining us. Um, so why don't we start with you, Will. Why don't, why don't you talk us through a little bit about REC, about how you're already delivering exceptional uh, customer experience and, and, and really what your plans are for the future. Yeah, uh, first, happy to be here, Mike. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, you, you kind of know that we, we really exist for one reason and one reason only, and that's to empower creative people to do more of what they love. Right. And um, when you think about what gets in the way of those, of those folks doing that is folks not having access to the proper resources to create at a high level. It's, you know, not being able to get access to the information to actually build a, a profitable business around their, their art. Or third, it's not getting access to the paid gigs, right, to, to actually help them fund the journey. Um, so for us, when we think about what we've built on the membership um, club side of things, um, the way that we give folks the experience is very human, right? Our membership team is really responsible for getting to know each and every member. And, you know, what we found really early is the folks who are most successful in our membership club are the folks who get in there and get to know our membership team and specifically Scarlett, right? Who, who is the head of our membership. And what we realized is if you got to know Scarlett and you build a relationship with her and she got to understand your goals, what she could do is say, hey, I heard you were trying to work on your marketing plan. Do you know that we have this event where we're talking about marketing strategies later on? Or did you meet this member who does digital strategy and, and you know they can help you out? Or, hey, you're a photographer. Did you know that there's such and such gig on the job board, right? So she started to personalize your experience and help you navigate this whole ecosystem that is REC in a super personalized manner. And over time, we kind of had this running joke and we said, well, every artist needs a Scarlet, right? Hmm. And, and we said, well, what would it look like to be able to scale scale up that that personal touch? And, you know, obviously being able to have multiple versions of, of Scarlet, the person is, is not a thing, right? Um, but being able to leverage the technology is. So for us, the future of how we engage our members is saying, okay, let's understand what goals our members are, are, are after and understand, you know, the behavior that they're, they're partaking in throughout the ecosystem, what events that they're attending, what studios they're booking, what jobs they're applying for, and then leverage that to personalize what we're actually delivering to them from a proactive manner, like what's been said earlier today, and saying, why, why is it that every morning members can't wake up and have a handful of gigs that are specifically um, curated for them that we know are, they're going to want? How about, you know, specific collaboration um, 
um, suggestions for you to get to know other members who are most relevant to you. Uh, and then obviously the information uh, that's going to be most relevant for you to achieve those goals that you have in mind. I think the way you describe that is really important. It's a human experience, right? right. I, and, I, and I think sometimes we, we lose sight of that when we think about technology and we think about its implementation. But what we're trying to do is really extend the human experience. And I think that's something that I'm not sure there's enough of a focus on. I read something recently, and I love the quote um, by a, a, a local sort of AI expert. And he had said, you know, I think the best way of, of really looking at AI now is as people. It's because at the end of the day, that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to create virtual people and your virtual human experiences that AI is really going to fill in the gaps on. So I think the way you describe that is fantastic. And I think that's really um, a great segue uh, to uh, uh, Josh, and, and I know Josh is going to uh, demo some of the work we've done here uh, as an example, but Josh, uh, just as a, a sort of precursor to that, can you talk to us a little bit about the work um, uh, 03 is doing with REC uh, and, and really how we're leveraging a a AI to sort of empower uh, customer experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like like uh, <laughs> you and Will said, uh, we're we're working on plenty of projects uh, with Rex, so that's been a, a fun experience. But specifically as it relates to AI, um, it's it's again really about empowering um, the user to to feel comfortable and to be pushed things that are aligned with them and their their user profiles um, and sort of you know create those connections. So throughout that chain. Um, without being prompted um, for input, uh, you know, providing opportunities for gigs, for events, um, you know, suggestions for bookings, um, you know, the whole range of of what the rec community offers um, being sort of geared towards the specific member so that their experience is definitely, you know, unique. And, and so hopefully we can replicate uh, Scarlet as, as good as possible, but we'll never be able to replace the, uh, the real true Scarlet. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's the real goal here is like, you know, it's not just about a asking ChatGPT about any questions you have. It's about um, specifically asking things or getting responses back within the context of rec and, and sort of being guided in that direction. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that's a, it's a great point. Um, well, let's dive in here, right? Like, you know, we can talk about this all day. I think it's, I think it's fun to sort of see what, how we're implementing this. Um, show us, uh, show us uh, Scarlet AI and, and, and at least sure. uh, the initial stages and kind of what we're doing. So um, I'm just going to load this up real quick. Um, so what we're going to show is, is two demos here. Um, the first and we should be able to see the screen now. So the first is is going to be, um, you know, a, a POC of, of Scarlet AI um, without any kind of personalization. Um, and when I say personalization in this context, um, for our personalized version, uh, we're passing in, you know, a user profile that's written in JSON that has a, a bunch of details about that user. So the language model has that ability to sort of react to it. Um, so, so what we're going to do is we're just going to, you know, introduce ourselves by, by saying, Hey, Scarlett, and, and keep in mind, again, this is from a user who is, is randomly coming to the site or, um, you know, Scarlett doesn't know anything about this specific user. Um, hey there, I'm Scarlett, your friendly rec community expert. How can I help you today? Are you looking for information on our creative spaces, workshops, or events? Or maybe you have a question about membership benefits. Let me know and I'll be happy to assist you. So we get a very generalized response here that's that's sort of talking about, you know, what the rec community has. Um, but what we're going to actually respond to here is, you know, we're looking to book a room and uh, we're going to see kind of how this follows up. So like one of the big things about rec is being able to book rooms for you know, doing certain things, whether it's audio, visual, um, you know, design, etc. cetera. Um, sure thing. To help you find the best room for your needs, could you please give me some details? What kind of room are you looking to book? Audio, video, visual, or experience? And are you looking to use any specific equipment or need any professionals like a cameraman, director, audio engineer, or lighting guy? Please provide as much information as possible, and I will find the perfect date for you. Already, it's 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 pretty comfortable, uh, and it feels like you're interacting with somebody, um, but it still doesn't know exactly who you are, and and that you know over time can get 
you know, become a nuisance um, because you're you're cons consistently having to uh, provide the information about who you are. Um, and, and you'll see the differences when we get into this personalized version. But still, the baseline is really, really solid in terms of the detail that we get and the directions we can go. Um, so what we're going to say here is, you know, I, I'm looking for a visual type of room because I'm a photographer. I have my own equipment, but I will need some lighting help. Got it. So you need a visual room and are looking for a lighting guy to help you out. Give me a moment to check the availability and I'll find the perfect date for you, considering both room and lighting availability as well as cost. So again, um, you know, we've provided that baseline information with regards to, hey, I'm a photographer, I have my own equipment, but I need lighting help as well. Um, so that that gives direction to the language model to kind of go in that in that path and really find those details. So we're going to respond by sort of just saying here that, you know, anytime works for me. Uh, so the first availability will be fine for whatever, um, you know, that search consists of. And uh, we'll, we'll see what we get back here. Um, I think it's also important to mention, uh, and I'll probably get interrupted by Scarlett, but um, th this is a video. Um, and, and the reason we're doing that is because um, Great. I've checked the availability and found the perfect option for you. The soonest and cheapest available date is on April 7th, 2023. You can book the dark room for $68 per hour and have a lighting guy assist you for $55 per hour. It's a weekend rate. So your total cost for one hour would be $123. Enjoy your photography session. So uh, again, a response here, and, and as I was saying, um, this is recorded uh, just because you know AI has a large amount of uh, uncertainty. So um, this is just perfect for the the context here, um, and and we're going to respond by saying, "Hey, you know, I'm st I'm stoked for you too. I'm sure you'll have an amazing <laughs> photo session in the dark room. Remember, if you need any further assistance or have questions about rec, feel free to ask." Have a fantastic time and capture those amazing shots. So sort of to, to wrap our heads around what this is, um, you know, we've had a, a flow from start to finish, um, you know, with a with a user uh, who is maybe randomly coming to, to Scarlet and sort of trying to get to where they want to go. Um, but already you can feel kind of engaged and, and comfortable with with this, you know, conversation. It's not like a standard robotic chatbot. It's very like, you know, I said I'm excited. So that that was reciprocated in the responses there. Um, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to demonstrate the personalized version. And this would be um, information that is coming from a CDP. Um, so this really connecting all of the tissue here. Um, so already Scarlett knows who I am. Um, so I'm going to start off the conversation by saying, hey, Scarlett, you know, welcome good morning, whatever I want to introduce myself with. Um, and also in, in certain contexts, Scarlett will Hey, Van Gogh. Welcome back to the rec community. How can I help you with your creative journey in videography, photography, or product design today? Feel free to ask about our facilities, events, membership perks, or anything else related to rec. I am here to support you in all things creative. So already, we get a hey Van Gogh, you know that's that's already like wow this this thing knows me, Scarlett knows me. Um, you feel welcomed back into what's going on, and and what we're going to do again is we're going to follow up here by saying you know I'm looking for a booking recommendation, and then I'd like to book that room. So what should happen here is that instead of asking, of course Van Gogh. Since you're skilled in videography, photography, and product design, I'd recommend booking the movie studio for a video or photo shoot, or the meeting space for brainstorming and planning your next product design project. As for the booking recommendation, please let me know the specifics such as the date range, desired time, and any additional equipment or personnel you might need, like a camera, lighting, or an audio engineer. That way I can find the soonest and most affordable date for you to book the perfect creative session. So already we didn't have to provide any of that extra detail about who I am because the language model knows that. Um, so we've already got, we've already identified, you know, what I'm looking for without saying it. And, and that's a huge connective piece here. Um, and and we'll certainly, the, the many times you interact with Scarlett, 
um, you know, keep you coming back and, and feeling like this is not a nuisance. This is something that I want to engage with. This is something that actually benefits me and my workflow um, and, and how I interact with the rec community. Um, but what we're gonna say is let's go with the movie studio. Um, I'll need a lighting guy and uh, we can book at the earliest occurrence. Um, and of course I'm excited to get in there because I like what I do. So um, we're just gonna sort of specify that to, to Scarlett and see if she's got any opinions on that. Um, but ultimately um, this, is, this is the difference. And, and, and as a user, you know, personally speaking, this, this really makes the difference from what you get in a standard chatbot experience to something that, that feels like it knows you. Um, and it's not in a creepy way. It, it, it's, it's very much- Awesome, Van Gogh. I've checked the availability for the movie studio and a lighting guy for you. The earliest and most affordable date for the movie studio with a lighting guy is on April 10th, 2023 from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. The movie studio will cost $120 per hour and the lighting guy will be $50 per hour on that weekday. The total cost for this one hour booking will be $170. Get ready to bring your creative vision to life in the movie studio. If you'd like me to proceed with booking this slot, please confirm and I'll take care of the rest. Great. So uh, we already get a um, pretty, uh, pretty detailed response here. I should also clarify that that REC is, is a credit-based system and not actually dollar amounts. But um, just for the sake of this proof of concept, we have those in there uh, as some detail. Um, so we're going to say, perfect, let's lock it in. And again, I'm stoked. Um, you know, we had a, <laughs> we had a, a stoked interaction uh, the last time, but um, we're going we're gonna to sort of just go with it for here. Um, and, and see what Scarlett says. Um, um, but yeah, overall, I think this whole process from top to bottom is- it Great news, Van Gogh. I've locked in your movie studio booking with a lighting guy on April 10th, 2023 from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. The total cost for this one hour booking is $170. Get ready to create some amazing content and unleash your videography skills. If you have any questions or need further assistance, feel free to ask. I'm here to support your creative journey at Warwick. And and of course we have uh, some some audio uh, generation at the end, um, <laughs> misnaming Rec. But ultimately, uh, what you've got here is from start to finish, you've got an easier and more personable experience. You know, backed by CDP information and information about the user and uh, we can go through the process in a more comfortable way. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great transition too. I mean, at the end of the day, right? People just wanna feel like they're connecting with people. And you know, I, I, I think what I've seen and what I think is interesting is we've done more and more experimentation with this sort of thing. The more personalized we can make it, the better. And, and, and the ability to personalize it, even in those subtle ways via data, via CDP, I think is, is, is really interesting. And I'm, I'm really, fascinated with where we'll go next but on that point well what does this what does this mean for rec like what does this mean to have this kind of experience and 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 ultimately you know what are your thoughts as far as where we can go next yeah i think it means a lot you know i think um again the community and the ecosystem that we've built is only as powerful and useful as your specific experience through it Right. Um, so to be able to, to have this sort of proactive approach um, and the proactivity that I know we're going to build on in the future, it means greater retention. Right. And greater retention for us as, as a membership organization means greater bottom line revenue, um, which is always important in the business. So I think that's a part of it. I think the second piece is what we're learning is, yeah, the example we went through, a lot of that was about the booking the studio space. But there's also tons of value in Scarlet AI itself as just something that can support members. Um, through connecting it to connecting you to other members, connecting you to information, um, connecting you to those events. And that even gives us an opportunity to say, hey, what does a digital membership look like for REC? Right. Where we're not just physical base in the Philadelphia region, if you're in 50 miles of the space, but here's some value we can put on the phones of creators worldwide, right? So it unlocks a whole new revenue opportunity in the ways that we can serve creators. Um, which is ultimately our mission. And then even think about when we see, you know, where the traction is and who's using it in cities around the world, using that to inform where we expand the, the physical footprint, right? Oh, wow. so, I, so I think those are like, you know, some, some top level implications. But, you know, what I get most excited by is just really thinking about how we mature Scarlet as the manager, right? Um, the AI manager for, for every creative. 
that most importantly just allows you to free up some of the blocking and tackling time that you're spending, um, bring you up to just do more of what you love, which is the creative part, right? You're not hunting for studios. You're not, you're not having spent as much time racking your brain on writing the most professional email possible because Scarlett will be able to support you in writing that language, right? To present yourself more professionally to a brand. Um, every artist out here wants someone on their behalf, hunting proactively for paid opportunities for them, thinking about who they should be building relationships with and even holding them accountable. And we believe that Scarlet AI will allow us to, to help creators do that. That's fantastic. You know, one thing to touch on there that, that you were hitting on is the scale it, it provides, Rec. I mean, and I think that's, you know, when we really think about AI from a business perspective, I mean, the efficiencies it provides, the you talking about the tediousness of the work that creators just want to create, right? I got to be honest, though. I, most people in any profession just want to do the fun parts of their job <laughs> that they got into versus the super tedious stuff that that you know sort of you know bogs them down on a regular basis and frankly that's the stuff that makes you work 50 60 hours a week as opposed to the stuff that you're really uh, dedicated to but back to scale i think that's a that's such a critical part of this and and i love how you sort of turn that on its head and then okay, this AI is going to tell us, you know, even where to expand, to, where do we need physical space? Wow, what a, what a, right. um, but we would be remiss if we didn't touch on some concerns. Um, now, you know, Josh brought up, you know, the fact that we record uh, some of these demos. Some of that is because we're, we're trying to make sure that we're, we're not falling apart um, with, uh, with uh, the technology or that the API doesn't go out and that sort of thing. Um, but the reality also is that sometimes we, we get in unintended results, and that is a thing that we're trying to sort out, right? So uh, just a couple um, quick questions here. So Josh, I'm, I'm going to give this to you real quick. Uh, potential risks, challenges, concerns from your perspective with this? And then, Will, I would love to hear that from your perspective as well. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've, we've heard most of the list, the, the risks in terms of hallucinations and incorrect information and uh, so on. I, I think it's important to look at that in, in a way of how can we ground this as best as possible and how can we avoid, you know, relying on the AI responses as being, uh, you know, 100% factual and 100% and um, accurate in terms of legal questions or health questions or anything along those sorts. So um, I, I think, I think there's, it's a pretty big, challenge to to solve a uh, pretty big problem to solve and um you know some of the ways we're looking at that is um basically pre and post processing of of responses from a, a single llm call um in the sense of you know maybe we're identifying hey is this response adhering to what we're looking for in terms of criteria or is this response sort of stepping outside of the bounds of what we deem to be responsible um, those are kind of the, the inner workings and the gears that, that we have to build into these chains from A to B. Um, and, uh, it is something that is, is top of mind, I think for any developer at the moment. Uh, you know, and also on that front too, sentiment, right? I mean, Hesh hit on this, uh, before when he was talking about CDP and sort of the capturing of, of content there, but the idea that like, this was a negative interaction. <laughs> Ultimately, if it's a negative interaction, why was it a negative interaction? What happened? Why did somebody get frustrated? Did that person lead the charge or did the AI lead the charge? So, well, how about from your perspective, uh, challenges, concerns? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the data and privacy stuff is is obviously, you know, top of mind, but I think someone else can speak a little bit more um, knowledgeably to that part. But for me, it's more of uh, actually what Steve ha asked in the chat. Um, he was asking about even just like, do we believe in expressing upfront to customers that this is AI and not a human? And what I responded to him with was, yeah. And one of those is just about managing expectations, right? Because um, again, we're talking about AI as a powerful tool to improve customer experience. I know for a creative who's trying to move quickly and get things done, if AI gives bad information or it's just too slow or, or it just slows down the process in any way, now you have a poor experience. And um we want folks to just understand, hey, we're, we're building this thing, it's going to get better, but we want to communicate those limitations of the technology up front and be transparent about that. Um, so anyway, I think the, the risk is balancing innovation with, hey, we're just going to ship things quickly and, and it's going to learn and it's going to get better. Um, and sometimes there will be hiccups, right, in the, in the process. And, and that's just a real thing that we all have to understand. And I think fortunately for our community, uh, we tend to be 
early adopters of technology. So, so we a have more, a, a little more open minded. <laughs> there, yeah, a lot more open minded, which is great. But again, the risk there is sometimes um, you have to be willing to slow down the experience to then ramp it up and make it exponentially better in the future. Yeah, totally. It, you, wow, what a great point, though. You know, the idea of like, you know, um, societal expectations for how we're going to engage with these things. I got asked a question um, a few weeks back, presentation Josh and I were giving around, um, you know, how polite should we be to bots? Like, not, <laughs> what a great question. I say please and thank you all the time to bots. <laughs> I don't know. I sort of look at it like I'm going to treat it like, you know, a human experience. I want to have a human experience. And I feel like that yeah. both ways. But, you know, I think there's something to be said there. It's something that we really need to think about. And I actually think that that um that well, I just want to uh, take one uh one of the audience questions and then and then we'll we'll switch over to our, our final part here. Um, uh, but I think it's a really great question. And this is specific for you, Will. It was uh, what were some of the personality traits or considerations you're looking for to replicate? Scarlet with this AI solution and and you know how are you feeling about you know that as a as an approach? Yeah, that that's a great question. Um, you know, some of the things off the top of my head that I know that that Scarlet really hits out of the park is one, she's an incredible listener, right? She's she's picking up on the things you're saying and also the things you're not saying, right? And and the things you're doing and also the things you're not doing to better understand how she can provide value, right? So that that first piece. Also, there, there's a, a thoughtfulness and, and a kindness that, that Scarlett just has, you know, organically. And even going a little bit further, there's a level of joy that you always get in interacting with Scarlett. And, you know, Josh was highlighting that during the demo, like reciprocating the excitement, right? Like we're talking about creators we're dealing with, right? We're all sensitive about our stuff. So like even just being able to have those those moments of just affirmation, you know, are, are key. And we want to bring that into the digital experience as well. Um, but I think the most important personality trait is just uh, a true come from of a place of I'm here to add value, mm -hmm. right? And and as much as we can continue to even whittle down the language so it's more punchy, more potent, more value packed, um, you know, that's going to be our North Star because, you know, that's that's what that role is, right? Um, that Scarlet embodies so well in real life. Um, it's about how can I be of service and how can I make your experience as seamless as possible. Yeah, that's that's a it's a great point. And I, I think that really ties back to what we were talking about up front with you know, understanding business objectives, the value that it provides, the value actual what we say Scarlet IRL uh provides, right? Um, is the same thing that we want to make sure we're hitting on. So um, well, with that said, um, and, and again, if anyone has any further questions, uh, we can always uh, get you connected. But I, I do want to thank Josh and Will uh, for for joining us um, and and you know putting the demo together and, and really working together on that. It, it was great. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna transition now into our last part. Um, so we we talked a little bit about this and we touched on uh, to a degree um, the um sort of concerns and the challenges um that we're dealing with uh with all, all of this um if anybody's you know aware i mean there's there's no shortage of, of legislation that's being considered there's a lot of conversations um around um a lot of these ai leaders really being concerned about you know regulation in general and, and for the first time not that there's going to be too much regulation but that, that there isn't enough regulation uh and there needs to be some thoughts around that so one of the things that we've really started to consider and and really dive into is really thinking about what what are those considerations how can we guide our clients um, as we dive into solutions to make sure that um, we're sort of in, encountering these these problems in, in, a, in a whole new light and make sure that those privacy security um legal concerns are really being addressed so uh with that said uh, i want to welcome uh andy bear um Andy works at uh, Cozen O'Connor. Uh, he is a privacy and security and now AI uh, lawyer. Uh, we had a, a great conversation recently. Um, or, or, you know, as we're starting to think about this stuff, you know, we have to start to assess our terms <laughs> in our contracts. And, and what does this mean? I mean, back in the day, right, when we had open source technologies come out, you know, we had to make sure that we were considering what that meant uh, within our contracts. Well, this is uh, uh, no real different, although different, I'll say, in, in, in a lot of different respects. Uh, but I want to welcome Andy, and, and, and I want to just kind of uh, hop right in here. And, and Andy, um, let's start with um, just key privacy confidentiality concerns um, that businesses need to address um, as they're navigating 
these AI solutions and as um, you know, they're starting to, to, to go on this journey. Thanks, Mike. And by the way, it's great to be here. Uh, so probably a good place to start with this is a quick snapshot of the privacy law landscape in, in the United States, um, which we're primarily concentrating on. I'll say a few words about Europe also, which is more active. One of the uh, frustrating things uh, for clients about uh, navigating the privacy landscape in the United States is, ex is it's extremely fragmented. So unlike in Europe, where you have the general data protection regulation, GDPR, there's no national privacy law here covering all types of processing of, of personal information. What we have uh, in place of that is a patchwork of federal, state, and local laws and regulations. Uh, some of these laws and regulations are sector or data specific. So at the federal level, these would include HIPAA for protected health information, the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act for personal financial information, uh, the Children's uh, Online Privacy Protection Act for information from children under 13 years of age. Um, at the state level, some examples of sector-specific laws are in Illinois, the Biometric Information Privacy Act, which is generating a lot of class action litigation, uh, and we'll, we'll touch on that later. In Washington, uh, there's also the newly passed Health Information Privacy Act. There are also nine comprehensive privacy laws, sort of GDPR light, at the state level, but not the, uh, the federal level. Um, and finally, going back uh, to the federal level, in the absence of a national privacy law, the Federal Trade Commission has interpreted its authority under the Federal Trade Commission Act to bring enforcement proceedings for what it sees as unfair or deceptive trade or marketing practices. And the FTC has kind of stepped into the vacuum left by Congress to regulate um, uh, data privacy and security at, at, at the federal level. So that's the, that's the landscape, um, and it, it, it's a patchwork, and it's uh, it's it's challenging uh, for clients, particularly small clients, you know, to navigate because you have these overlapping but inconsistent uh, privacy regimes. So looking specifically at AI, the widespread um, introduction of AI raises a number of hot button privacy issues. Uh, so we've already said uh, we've already talked about the possibility of personal information uh, being uh, sent to uh, public type of AI algorithms like ChatGPT uh, on a confidentiality level. Even when you're not talking about personal data, there have been instances uh, where corporations have, uh, like like Samsung, have leaked their proprietary source code to ChatGPT and other AI algorithms. Personal information um, can be used as parts of training sets uh, for AI, and regulators are taking a harder look at this. It can be used to build profiles on people for targeted advertising. So some of these uses, um, particularly when you're talking about sensitive information like precise geolocation data um, or, or health information, uh, part of this is, is what the California Privacy Rights Act and other states' privacy laws have in mind by requiring impact assessments for high-risk processing activities. And some of these state privacy laws also require opt-in consent for processing sensitive data elements like the ones I, uh, I named earlier. Um, so let's look at the retail industry. Retailers use of face and body scanning technology to provide virtual try-ons of articles of clothing and accessories. This can raise issue under Illinois' uh, Biometric Information Privacy Act, um, and that's the subject of a lot of class action lawsuits. Uh, the use of AI with facial recognition technology is also the subject of increasing regulations by cities and some states, as well as the FTC, as I mentioned before. So to give you just one example, Mike, uh, in a case called EverAlbum recently, the FTC required companies to destroy algorithms and models that they built using facial recognition data that the FTC said companies had deceptively collected or retained. Wow. Um, and getting back to uh, BIPA in Illinois, as I mentioned, there was a lot of litigation based on allegations that AI analyzes facial geometry, which is, is considered biometric data that is regulated under that statute. So, you know, at a high level, those are some of the privacy concerns. I mean, to handle those, uh, you should do data maps, know what data you have, what exactly you're, you're, you're using it for. 
uh, have good transparent privacy policies uh, say what you do and do what you say uh, is, is you know is really uh, you know my motto um, impact assessments you know particularly when you're using facial recognition technology or using uh, AI to use data in targeted advertising and these impact assessments you want to balance sort of the commercial benefits to the company against the possible privacy risk to the consumer. So, you know, unfortunately, um, and, and, and I would say this for AI regulation in general, a lot of this is, is inchoate. Um, you have these laws on the books. Most of them do not deal specifically with AI, but regulators and class action plaintiffs lawyers are thinking of creative new ways to, uh, you know, apply them to the use of AI in the marketplace. Uh, it sounds uh, like I would expect, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Uh, you touched on a bunch of stuff there, and 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 sort of just a sort of follow up to that. You know what I'm hearing a lot of though is that it is going to be messy for a while, um, and and there are opportunities here for organizations to protect themselves. You highlighted a, a few there, and and I would be interested in in thinking about you know from your perspective. What are the things that, you know, we can do now to really plan for the future? Because obviously the legislation is going to be in flux for a while and you see it globally. But, you know, especially as we're getting into these like little POCs and whatnot with, with clients, and then they're starting to expand into larger, more full-blown solutions. Just your thoughts on that and, and where can we go next? Sure. Um and, I, and I'll sort of, uh, if it's okay, I'll expand that to include, uh, you know, general compliance issues involving AI, you know, in addition to privacy. So, uh, you know, in privacy, we all, you know, we already talked about uh, privacy policies, uh, data processing impact assessments, um, all that, all that good stuff. There are other possible legal issues associated with the development, uh, use, and commercialization of, of AI. There's a lot of concern, uh, as was already mentioned by previous speakers, around uh, you know bias. So there are a number of laws on the books, like the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, uh, that aren't AI specific, but can be applied by regulators to um, uh, to to attack what they see as algorithmic bias in decision-making that has serious consequences for human beings. So think of uh, the use of AI to make decisions regarding employment, um, credit, uh, health, criminal justice, uh, insurance, that, you know, that sort of thing. And so uh, to avoid uh, a, a discrimination lawsuit um, or a regulatory investigation, companies should think about conducting regular bias auditing and document the results of that auditing. Bias can be introduced either in the design of the algorithm or uh, the introduction of unrepresentative machine learning training sets. Um, so for example, if you have, um, you know, if you have a, uh, a, an AI algorithm that is supposed to help employers to screen resumes uh, for prospects to interview, um, but you train them on a dating, uh, on, on a training set, that uh, is made up entirely of people who look like me, um, you could, you know, run afoul of New York City's new law around AI in employment. So New York City has a new law coming into effect in a couple months uh, that essentially says that if you use AI in employment related decisions, the example that I gave earlier would, uh, you know, would count for that. You have to make certain disclosures to the, the job candidates and you have to conduct a bias on it. Right. Uh, the second thing that you can do is try to commit to some sort of recognized AI safety or accountability standards. So, for example, the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology a few months ago issued a, a voluntary safety and accountability standard setting forth various principles, uh, transparency, accountability, proper human oversight, privacy, et cetera, et cetera, for the development of AIs. Um, none of these uh, accountability and safety standards, and there are a number of them in the AI community, is mandatory as of yet, but I think that's a way that uh, the law may be going. I could see, you know, at some point uh, soon, legislation either 
you know, prescriptively requiring the adoption of one of these standards, for example, the, the NIST standard, or maybe providing it as a safe harbor in litigation. So the way that would work is, you know, if you um, if, if you sell or commercialize an AI, you know, algorithm and you're hit with a discrimination lawsuit or some other type of safety lawsuit around the AI, if you can document that you've committed to some sort of safety and accountability standard, maybe that's a defense. Uh, IP risk is is a huge issue around uh, AI. We already mentioned what happened with uh, you know Samsung's uh, source code. So there are two types of issues in managing IP risk. First, um, how can the company protect? Uh, inventions or copyrightable works of authorship that are created, uh, that it creates using the assistance of AI, and how does it manage um, uh, infringing other people's rights in, in training AI algorithms and using uh, generative AI? So uh, the interesting thing about AI is that the U.S. Copyright Office has held that um, um, an AI cannot create a copyrightable work. The U.S. Patent Office has held that an AI cannot create um, an invention that can be protected by by patent. However, there's there are uh, levels of hu human intervention in training and instructing the AI um, that might rise to the level of of being able to be protected under IP law. So where you don't want to be is if you're a company um, developing something that you want to protect as as proprietary. Uh, you don't want it to be bereft of the protection of the U.S. Uh, IP laws. Um. But to give the example. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just to say, wow, because that, that sort of opens up the door for a lot of problems, especially now as people continue to use AI. And I know we have as well for brainstorming, idea generation. And I'm not saying that the ideas are, are fundamentally wholly unique, but then there's a question of like, what what is that balance between what we determined versus what the AI determined mm -hmm. uh, to really you know create that precedent? Right. That's exactly right. Now, it, you know, to give ChatGPT as an example, you know, say uh, SGP to ChatGPT to sort of, you know, write me a, a script uh, for a webinar that uh, sounds like a 16th century Shakespearean sonnet is written in that style. That's like a common example I like to use. Uh, what it produces um, may or may not be copyrightable, but if I give it detailed uh, and creative enough instructions, in developing that sonnet, uh, maybe you know, maybe there's copyright there. Uh, I should right. just... all of a sudden we're copywriting the prompt, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, out, which, which and... is honestly, if you ask me too about where a lot of this stuff's going in the prompt design by itself, will be what you do is features. you try to copyright the work, but you'd say that the, the eventual work was driven by your prompt, which met the necessary statutory standard of creativity that, you know, it made you essentially a co-author of that, uh, of, of, of that sonnet. Uh, so those are the issues that courts are going to have to tangle out. Um, I should also just briefly mention with IP um, that, you know, a lot of AI is trained by scraping websites. So that could, uh, that could violate copyright that could violate terms of use um, or anti-hacking laws that have been creatively used against uh, website scrapers. So I'm not, I'm certainly not saying scraping is illegal per se. Uh, there's, there's, uh, you know, it's a widely, um, wi widely done practice and it's become commercially recognized, but there've been instances of generative AI, uh, for example, lifting a uh, Getty stock photography and then reproducing it in its work product and re reproducing the Getty wall watermark, uh, which Getty wasn't too happy about. So, you know, in, in creating an IP policy for a company that leverages AI, you have to think about minimizing risk of infringement as well. Um, the next, uh, you know, the, the next thought that I would have um, for protecting the company from AI related risks is, you know, implement policies for the use of chat GPT and other, uh, you know, other AIs, large language models and generative AI by employees. And, you know, some of that will be stuff we already discussed, you know, don't upload, uh, you know, uh, sensitive corporate data to, uh, you know, to public AIs, you know, be, be careful about P the use of PII to train uh, AIs. It'll be different for every organization, but that's that's sort of a best practice. Um, cybersecurity, I, I'll bracket that for now, since that's a whole separate topic. But when you amass large data, Databases of uh, you know of sensitive data, 
for training AIs or for AIs to leverage. Uh, obviously, there's security risks. You should have a written information security plan and uh, sort of best practices, encryption, multi-factor authentication, and all that good stuff. Um, and last but not least, I would say to protect the company, if you're developing or selling AI or heavily leveraging it in your in your product or service, think about having appropriate contractual protections. And you know, Mike and I, you and I are having a Mike, you and I are having an ongoing a conversation about that, but. You know, one thing I'll say at a high level uh, so that I don't make the audience's eyes glaze over too much is standard, you know, contractual protections like representations and warranties uh, around compliance with laws, things that are taken as commercially standard in contracts and are not really, you know, uh, that controversial in legal ne negotiations that can have a whole new definition in, uh, you know, in, in the use of AI because the laws are in co -aid. So, you know, if I develop for you um, an, an AI that's going to help you screaming to screen, uh, you know, job applicants for employment, to go back to my early example, and the New York City comes after uh, comes after you as my customer, uh, saying that it violates that, you know, vi violates, um, you know, their new law, their new AI law. Who's responsible for that? You know, um, is it really fair to place all the responsibility on the seller uh, when, as I said, you know, these laws are in Kuwait? Obviously, the buyer is upset. So there are various contracting strategies you can, you know, you can use around this. Um, but, you know, restructuring contracts is, is definitely something and limiting liability is definitely something that uh, countries, uh, companies lever leveraging AI should scrutinize. Yeah, one one point on that, and you and I discussed this, um, which you know, I got to be honest, we're still sort of juggling what this looks like. But you know, it's it'd be one thing if we're building AI tools or AI solutions, and they're very bespoke. I think the reality, similar to when we talk about Martech stacks, et cetera, is we will leverage a handful of existing models. We will tie those models back to products. Within all of those, they'll have their own terms and of service and 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 privacy and security policies that then my hope is we can leverage to a degree for the conversations we'll have with our customers. I mean, does that make this conversation a lot more complex? Does it make it more simplified a little bit? Or do I get to just lean on them and say, hey, they have a policy already and I can use that? So as a you know as a seller leveraging ChatGPT or some other um, you know some other third party AI platform, um, you'd absolutely want to you know want to do that. Say you know this is a best in breed type of AI we're leveraging. You know here's a link to its privacy policy. Here's a link to its audits certifications. You know any bias or auditing et cetera et cetera. You know we want to assure you the customer that. You know, we're using safe and accountable AI, but we can't be responsible for, you know, open AI. That's sort of the same contracting strategy that, uh, you know, sort of SaaS companies that host on AWS use, you know, when negotiating privacy and security and, and, and service level standards. Hey, we're, you know, we're not using Slick Vinny's hosting service. We're using a best in breed, um, you know, which has lots of audit certifications. It's ISO compliant. You know, here's all the information about its privacy and security policies. But if something happens to AWS, uh, we we can't be responsible. So you know, if I'm the uh, if I'm the seller or the developer, um, that that's absolutely the tack that I'm going to want to take, and hopefully that becomes commercially accepted. However, before or I should say, until you have sort of a a commercial standard for negotiating AI issues. You may have some customers who say, "No, that's your vendor. You should be fully responsible for them," even though that's totally unrealistic. Uh, so you know, I'm hoping, uh, Mike, it goes in that direction, but it's also new. We'll see. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, it's funny. I, I was um, uh, speaking with somebody recently, and, and they pointed me to that's uh, basically a a um, AI legislation tracker, um, which is just nuts. And <laughs> you see how much how much is being discussed and what's happening on a day to day basis. I, I think the reason it got developed, um, uh, if I if I recall, was basically so that you know, obviously, some people could track this stuff, but then like crossing cross compare the legislation state to state and that sort of stuff to make sure that that some of these guidelines made sense but it's all been pretty fascinating uh all right we're, we're running up against time here Andy uh I, I do there was a, a couple audience questions that I, I want to hop into here um 
So the first one is, do you foresee a world where regulated industries will have specific guidelines for leveraging tools like ChatGPT or other AI related uh, tools to access a, a broad set of data information the internet? I, I think what we're talking about are, are, is the, the point there is the, um, the regulated industries, right? The financial companies of the world, the health companies of the world. Um, how, how are they going to deal with this specifically and, and what, what might that entail? So I, I expect them to have um, AI exhibits, you know, to their voluminous contracts, uh, you know, just like they have privacy and, and, and security exhibits. So um, if you're talking about banks and, uh, you know, other financial companies, they're regulated by the FFIEC, which is a consortium of financial regulators that includes the OCC, FD, uh, FDIC, you know, alphabet soup, you know, as you know. And, you know, those regulators have been uh, issuing guidance uh to those in you know to those banks and financial services companies uh for 15 20 years on managing risk in vendor contracts around privacy and information security uh i imagine they're going to do the same thing around chat gpt i'm already seeing uh banks and financial services companies and some contracts i do with them uh you know require the disclosure of use of those platforms or sometimes prohibit them altogether um, so that's going to tie into their privacy and security policies. Pharma companies uh, also regulated are the most conservative companies I, <laughs> I, I personally deal with, even more conservative than banks and financial services companies, which really, you know, says something. So I, I absolutely expect them to have flow down requirements for their vendors. Um, you know, limiting the use of AI to certain situations. Um, and then they would have, if you look at a pharma company, they would have concerns not around pro just privacy and security, but also creation of intellectual property. A AI can be used to create new drugs. Moderna said it was All that, yeah. I saw instrumental that in, in, yeah. in ex expediting the Pfizer vaccine, uh, sorry, the um, the COVID vaccine in, in 2020. So obviously those types of companies want to protect their, their IP. So, you know, the... Uh, the short answer is yes. I think we're going to start to see standard exhibits and flow down requirements around all of this from, from regulated industries. Um, the regulators are behind the uh, the eight ball, as always. You know, It really wasn't until the late 20 aughts, early 2010s that they started to I issue regulations around, you know, cloud services and outsourcing. But, you know, eventually they'll catch on. I'm, I am curious, and this sort of ties to a second question here. We'll, we'll wrap up on this one. Um, around sort of legal cases or precedents that are, in this case, they were talking about influence data uh, uh, privacy and security practices. But as you just touched on that, I would include AI practices. And and what are people seeing that's really, you know, starting to shape those policies? Um, and, and, and what can we expect? So I think we're a long way from a national AI law, despite all these laws that have been introduced, despite the Department of Commerce, you know, requesting comments on, on regulations. Despite, despite the CEO of we don't have a privacy court. <laughs> yeah, we don't have a we don't have a privacy law. Right, right. <laughs> you know, privacy, always on. Uh, privacy has been a big issue for 20 years. Um, so what I would suggest, I mean, for companies and what I'm doing in my practice is, um, you know, is look to the FTC. Uh, in the absence of national consensus on, on these issues, the FTC steps in to fill the gap. And we have a very um, uh, aggressive and activist uh, FTC chairperson in, in, you know, in Lena Khan, who has uh, expressed an interest in getting into this area and um, particularly around biometric, the use of biometric data in, uh, in AI, facial recognition data and all that good stuff. Um, so the way you sort of observe them is they just bring uh, enforcement proceedings for uh, what they see as unfair or deceptive acts and practices. And some of the things that they've said uh, you know about AI, for example, just to you know rattle a few off. Um, in the 2021 blog post, the FTC commented that selling or using a racially biased algorithm would constitute an unfair trade practice. In on April 25th of this year, they got together with a bunch of other federal agencies uh, and to issue a, essentially a mission statement on discrimination and bias in AI and automated systems. Uh, the FTC specifically stated that it may violate the FTC Act to use automated tools that have discriminatory impacts uh, to make claims about AI that are not substantiated, uh, and they also require companies to 
uh, take steps to assess and mitigate risks before deploying AI. And you know, if they find out that you're using data uh, to train or create AI that uh, was collected in violation of your privacy uh, policies, they may require you to destroy that data and even destroy the algorithm, as I mentioned earlier. So I think they're going to be our most active, you know, regulator for the time being. So I'd encourage, uh, you know, I'd encourage companies to follow the steps I mentioned before and uh, and keep an eye on the FTC. Awesome. Well, Andy, this was fantastic. Um, really appreciate all the insight. I mean, clearly it's a it's a moving target and going to continue to be one for a while. I think, you know, as we think about our privacy security policies, as we think about developing AI policies within our contracts as an organization, and then those considerations as uh, businesses out there are starting to engage with various AI products and then thinking about how that, you know, ties back to um, customer data, um, even internal employee data and, and that sort of thing. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for um, people to pause and really make sure that that's a, a strong consideration before getting into um, some of these projects. Um, you know, my hope is that it doesn't completely slow us down <laughs> as we're starting to get into it. Maybe the uh, lack of consensus will help to um, continue the, the path forward. But, you know, I think there's been enough concern uh, voiced by the leaders in in the space that to know that like it's it's it is worthwhile and and and, and going to be very necessary for us all to to take that pause and to really make sure we're we're considering that at a deep level. So thanks, Andy. Appreciate it. Um, you know, I, one thing I will I will say um, as we're as we're sort of closing out here, um, as I think everybody can see uh, on the whole, um, you know, the the cross section between what we're doing um, from um, a data and analytics perspective, what we're doing from an AI perspective, um, all of the factors that are kind of going into it to create, you know, these really remarkable experiences. Um, it's it's complex and it requires that you sort of have a little bit of a crawl, walk, run strategy uh, as we approach it. I think that, you know, there's a there's a time and a space right now for people to really and, and organizations really to consider that. Uh, we at O3 are, are officially launching a data analytics and AI consulting practice um, as an arm to our, our CX consulting business uh, today. Um, we're excited to, to introduce that uh, with all of the, the, the panelists and speakers here. So um, as we're um, kind of signing off here, just want to thank all, all of our uh, uh, speakers and, and panelists. Um, you all have been great. I think provided a lot of insight. If anyone wants to follow up with additional questions, um, we can we'll we'll certainly be following up over email and and, and you know we can create that uh, that connection with the individuals. So uh, thank you all and uh, have a great.